Look, I want to also say one thing to you. This stuff is kind of heady. So I'm doing my best to keep this like fun and visual because when you get lost in thought, it's going to be hard to apply this. And so first of all, I want to commend you for sticking with this because now we're going to dig into the exercise. I wanted you to have the understanding because oftentimes I personally find that if somebody just throws a science back tip or exercise or tool or tactic or strategy at me, it sounds so dumb on the surface that without the underlying kind of research and mechanics and science that explains why this simple thing works, you will literally roll your eyes and not do it. So now that you have that background, I'm going to reward you with the exercise that I want you to practice. And this one is simple. So if you're cynical, if you're really smart, if you're analytical, it will sound stupid. But I want you to hang in there because there is a really powerful thing going on in your neural pathways when you try this. And it's also an incredibly cool and fun thing to do with your family, with your friends. In fact, I get texts from people all over the world who are doing it. And my kids who do not live with us are two adult daughters. They constantly text me pictures of what I'm about to ask you to do. So I promise you it's worth trying. This is an exercise called looking for hearts. And this is how you play it. Every single day when you wake up, you are going to go on a scavenger hunt in your day-to-day -day life, and you are going to try to find a naturally occurring heart shape somewhere in the world. It could be a cloud that's shaped like a heart. You could look at your coffee and see that the foam on top has made the shape of a heart. You might get out of your car and you'll see a stain on the floor or a leaf that's the shape of a heart. I constantly, constantly see rocks. I see heart shapes in the top of mountain ranges. I see the shape of hearts uh, in brick buildings all the time in terms of the different colors of bricks. And here's what's interesting about this. What you'll realize is that there are probably eh, 10,000 heart shapes that are around you in your day-to-day -day life. The stain on the carpet, the spot on your dog's back, the tear in a pair of pants, the shape of a leaf. They're everywhere. They're absolutely everywhere. And right now, you walk right by them. Why? Well, because they're not important to you. You have not told the bouncer of your brain to let the hearts in to the nightclub. So you are walking right past all these things, and they are actively being blocked out. It is not in your conscious mind. The second you start playing this game, find a heart, you will experience something amazing you will experience your brain going to work for you. And so here's how I want you to play this, because I do want you to play this every single day. This is truly not a game about finding hearts. This is about training your mind. This is a game where you are telling your mind, I am the freaking boss, bouncer of the mind. I pay your salary. You are going to do what I tell you to do. You are going to find me a heart. And if you want to get paid, you are going to find me a heart. That is your job today. Find me a heart. So get intentional about that. And then I want you to go through your life and just let a heart shape in. And when you see it, here's what I want you to do. And if you're really analytical, you're going to think this is the cheesiest damn thing you've ever heard. But I want you to do this because there's neuroscience involved. When you see that heart, I want you to pause and I want you to really stare at it for a minute. You can take a photo of it. If it's a rock, you can pick it up or a leaf and take it with you because I want you to reward your brain for being flexible and for trying to help you. I want you to take that moment for real, as cheesy as this sounds, the foam on the top of your coffee, the shadow on the floor. I want you to take a minute and really savor it and literally just go, holy shit, there it is. That's pretty cool. Yesterday, I walked right past this and I didn't even see it. Thank you, mind. Wow. You, you, you just changed in real time. You just let something in that I asked you to let that in. And if you really want to supersize this, if you're somebody that's really struggling with a sense of self-worth or hope or really believing that you can turn things around, I want you 
to look at that and tell yourself that that was placed there for you to find. That this was placed there because you needed to see evidence that it is in fact possible to change the way you think. It is in fact possible to tell your mind what you want to see more evidence of and for your mind to work for you. And once you see one heart, you will start seeing hearts everywhere. The more hearts that you see, the more that you are connecting into magic, the more that you realize that your brain is trying very hard to help you. It is going to point out hearts in the moss. It's going to point out hearts on the sidewalk. You're going to see hearts on people's clothing. You're going to see them in paintings. It's weird. They're like everywhere. It's as if there is this entire world that you and I live in, and we walk by it every single day. And I think that's true about everything that you want, that there is evidence all around you that things are working out, that people are trying to help you, if you're willing to see it. You know, at the end of the day, finding hearts is not about finding hearts. It is about something so much bigger because it's proof that you can change the wiring in your mind. You can manipulate and program this filter, the RAS, to make it work for you. And every time you see a heart, it is evidence that it is true. And so it's important because this is the first step of a mindset reset. Because if you didn't think, hmm, my mind can change. It can allow me to see the world differently. If I can't get you to see and experience that, you will never even bother trying thought substitution. And I will say there is something that some of you may experience. So this comes from Nady in Germany. And she wrote, you know, Mel, I loved what you said about looking for hearts. And I've been trying it. And I even saw two hearts within an hour. But then I got nervous and was almost afraid to find them. So how do you overcome the fear of making things better? I relate to this because we're used to the way that things are. We're used to the default programming in our minds, even if it makes us miserable. And when you start to catch a glimpse of how things could be different, I think sometimes if you've experienced a tremendous amount of heartache or you've tried so many times to put yourself out there, the idea of believing again that it's worth trying again, that that is what's scary. Here's what I have to say to you. This is not about hope. This is hard science. Because you're living with programming right now. And I am here to tell you it's outdated. In fact, when you start to really play around with this next piece of how you change the way that you think, you're going to realize that you're not even listening to your voice. You're listening to someone else's voice. It's probably your mom's or your dad's or in other caregivers. Because that negativity that's in your mind that chips away at you, that default programming that you don't even really hear, for me, I call it my campaign of misery. I did not create this when I was six or seven or eight. I was taught this. And so you're going to start to realize that not only do you have the power to change the filter, yes, you can see reasons to be happy. Yes, you can spot wins instead of reasons why you're a loser. Yeah, you can pay more attention to the people in your life that make you feel great instead of chasing the ones that make you feel like crap. You can change all of this. You can make your mind work for you. But what you're going to realize very quickly is, holy cow, like there's this default thing in my mind that's like fighting my desire to be happy. It's fighting my desire to win. And so that's where we're going to go next. Because there is an entirely different reality. One of the reasons why I always say to you is, I love you. I believe in you. I believe in your ability to create a better life. The reason why I say that to you all the freaking time, and I mean it, is because I know you don't say that to yourself. 
And I didn't say that to myself for a long time either. And I don't need to meet you to say, I love you. Because love is a verb. Love is how you show up in the world. This podcast is an act of love for me. It is a way to connect with you. It's a way for me to support you and empower you. And I show up here because I do believe in you. You, I don't care what's happened to you. You cannot convince me that you cannot change. I have way too much evidence on my side. You only have your experience. I've got an army of a million people that I've seen change. And so I know you can change because I know you can take the actions to make your mind a better place. You can take the actions to make your life feel better. You can take the actions to improve your relationship with yourself. And this is the most exciting part. This is the thing I am working on myself day in and day out. You can take the actions that reclaim your brain, that reprogram your mind, and that make your mindset and your thoughts work for you. I mean, all this shit is made up that we're saying anyway. So if you can think bad thoughts, why not think good ones? Does it actually make you happy to tell yourself that you suck and that there's something wrong with you? And is it even true? So if you can make that crap up, if you can adopt what somebody else says about it, can't you make up your own? Of course you can. And so let's get to that substitution diet. This is the Mel Robbins way to describe what researchers call cognitive bias modification. It's literally catching default thoughts and substituting something better. And one of the best example of this is the next time that you start obsessing, obsessing over what could go wrong. What if I don't like it? What if it doesn't work? What if I get rejected? What if I did it? What if I look stupid? What if they judge me? What if this? What? Say this. What if it works out? What if it works out? The more you say out loud, what if it works out? You substitute the negative bullshit with something positive. What if it works out? I mean, can you argue with me on that one? What if it works out? I didn't say it will work out. I said, what if it does? Because you don't know whether it's going to work out or not, do you? And when you allow your default wiring to filter the world with the belief and the thought that, what if it doesn't work out? What if I fail? What if this? What if that? Those thoughts filter the world a certain way. The thought, what if it doesn't work out, makes you not apply. It makes you not write that book. It makes you not go to the gym. It makes you sit home alone. Those thoughts are filtering your experience of life a particular way. And because the filter in your brain is paying attention to what you care about, it believes that's what you want. So as you scan the world around you, you see reasons why it's not going to work out. Didn't happen last time. It's a weird world after the pandemic. I don't want to embarrass myself. I feel uncomfortable. When you start to engage in thought substitution, what if it all works out? What if leaving my house is the best decision I've made in a decade? What if I meet the person that I was destined to meet? What if going to 90 meetings in 90 days at AA changes my life? What if it all works out? See how that mindset switch, cognitive bias modification, See how that leads you to feeling more encouraged? What if I make these 10 cold calls and nobody takes the call, but I'm okay? What if I walk up to this house that I think is going to go on the market and I knock on the door and it turns out I buy it before it comes on the market? What if I get into my dream school? You're more likely to apply if you're like, well, what if it does work out? And this is why this is so important. Because your brain is paying attention to what's important to you. And I don't think any of us have a clue how much airtime we give to negative thinking, to beating ourselves down, 
to assuming that life is going against you, to thinking something's wrong, to beating yourself up, to comparing yourself to other people. And when you start to pay attention to two facts, number one, your mind is trying to help you. And number two, when you figure out what's important to you and you make it a priority, your mind will adjust in real time and help you see an entirely new world. And when you see that it's possible that you could get into your dream school, that's a whole new world. When you see that it's possible that you'll make the best friends of your life in the next year of your life, a whole new world is possible. When you see that you can not only get your dream job, but you can land your dream job and it has a bonus, a whole new world is possible. And it begins with two simple things I want you to do. Look for hearts so you experience that a whole new world is possible, that there's a world that you're walking by every day. This is critical. I do this every single day. And, you know, it sounds like such a dumb thing. And I often think about, you know, this moment where a reporter's like, so what's your secret to success? And I'm like, look, I look for a heart every day. I mean, it sounds so stupid, doesn't it? But what I'm actually saying is I am actively engaged in the process of training my brain. Just like you would lift weights or resist weights or whatever it is that you do if you want biceps, you are training your body to be strong. I am training my mind every single day to work for me. And every time I see a heart, it's a reminder. Oh, yeah, my brain will tell me what I want it to tell me. And so I can either let the campaign of misery take control of my RAS or I can tell my brain, no, it is important to be happy. It is important to feel like I'm winning. It's important to put myself out there in life. I need some help with this brain. And so the hearts for me is a simple way to explain this profound amount of research out there and put it into practical use. And this idea of a substitution diet for the shit you've been thinking forever that no longer serves you, that's a simple way for me to explain to you. You, you're not stuck with the thoughts that you think. That idea right there, that's the whole thing. That's everything. You are not stuck with the thoughts that you think. You can let them rise up, but you don't have to grab them and grip onto them and wrestle them to the ground. You'd be like, oh, there's that stupid thought that my dad taught me to think. Bye, dad. I choose to think something else because I know what cognitive bias modification is. And that horse shit that you said that I was a failure or didn't mount up to something or wasn't wanted, I don't believe that shit anymore because it's important to me to not only see hearts, but it's important to me to encourage myself, to believe in myself, to believe in my life and my effort and my ability. Because that's what I believe. That's why I'm here. You can do this. If I can do this shit, you can do this stuff. You have no idea how screwed up I was. If you wanted to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody that had, like, the darkest thoughts in the world, Mel Robbins will go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you any day. And you cannot get rid of it entirely, but thought by thought, you can learn how to not get hooked by it, and you can learn how to start to reprogram your mind. And I'm also going to tell you something. I said at the very beginning, it's not one and done. Like, this is not toxic positivity. I'm not here to sell you a pill to make your problems go away. I'm here to tell you that there will be times in your life where the negativity comes back and the default comes back and things get overwhelming. That happened to me just six months ago. When big things happen in your life, it can take you down for a little bit. But coming back to this stuff over and over, looking for hearts, there's the confirmation. I still, even though life sucks, my, my brain is still trying to help me. And really, I'm telling you, I call it hand-to-hand -hand combat with your mind because that's what you're engaged in. Those negative thoughts either hook you and take you down or you're like, boop, that's interesting. My grandmother's still bitching at me and she's dead. 
I don't really need this in my default program anymore. You know, that's what's available to you. So I mentioned earlier that um, this uh, cognitive bias modification uh, tools that we're talking about today work because not only have I used them in my own life, but also because we've had 250,000 students that I've taught a course about reframing your mindset, resetting your mindset to. And we do these extensive surveys afterwards. And one of the things that I uh, know from our data is that the number one negative thought that people struggle with is, I'm not good enough. And I believe that everybody struggles with this. There are two reasons why. Number one, many of you grew up in a household where your lived experience was that you were told you weren't good enough or you felt like you weren't good enough. And even if you grew up in a household where you didn't feel that way, you felt safe, you felt secure, you went to an elementary school or a middle school and you went through the period of human development called adolescence and teenage years where you separate from your family and your number one objective developmentally is to bond with friends. And it's during that horrendous period of time that we call middle school that most of us start to size ourselves up in relation to other groups of people. Oh, there are the theater kids. I'm not good enough for them. Oh, the sports kids. I'm not good enough for them. Oh, the rich kids. I'm not good enough for them. It's a protection mechanism because you don't want to get hurt by approaching a group that you think is going to reject you. This is totally normal. We all have it. And ironically, what we do is we tell ourselves we're not good enough for certain groups or certain people, but our brains pay attention. And our brains at that little age and the filter in our brain starts to change and starts to scan the world for all the places you don't belong. That's my opinion about where it begins. It is part of everybody's development to go through this period where life is a sorting hat and you're trying to figure out where you fit in. And I wish that our brains did the opposite and basically scanned the world and were like, oh, well, let's just scan and see all the opportunities to fit in so that you amplify your strengths. But instead, we focus on our lack and we do it as little kids. And because we've been doing it for so long, whether it began inside your, your home because of how you were treated or in your community because of how you were treated, it definitely was an experience that you had when you were younger, of trying to fit in. It happens to all of us. And the opportunity of your adult life and the rest of the time that you have is to reclaim your experience of life, to see all the places, not where you don't fit in, but all the places where you can go, all the places where you could be, all the wins that you have, all the strengths that you have, all the magic you have to give. That's the opportunity when it comes to changing your mindset and changing your brain. And when you take that on, because I believe that's true. I believe you fit in. I believe you belong. I believe you have incredible gifts to share with the world. I believe that you deserve happiness. I believe that you have huge wins every single day and that I want you to give yourself credit for them. I believe that you've survived a ton of crap and you don't even give yourself credit for that. I believe that you're pretty awesome. And I want you to start to have a brain that filters the world in that direction. And so that's why I'm telling you this. We all struggle with it to some extent. And in moments of weakness, it's going to be there again. But that's okay because you can search your hearts and you can tell yourself, what if it all works out? You can remind yourself that we're all a work in progress. You can look for wins every day instead of the things that went wrong. You can spend more time with people that make you feel good instead of chasing places you really don't like. All of this is possible. And I want this for you, which is why I hope you'll try this. And simple reframes, if you don't feel good enough, is you can be like, I'm a work in progress. I can figure it out. The people who love me are the people who I need in my life. This is important. I, I really hope you take this on. And 
this is the work that you'll do for the rest of your life. And it, it's worth it because the happiest days of our lives are the road ahead of us. Truly, I want that for both of us. And I've spent far too much time beating myself up and looking for what's wrong and searching for reasons to feel tortured or lonely and to stop myself. It's just horseshit. I'm so sick of it. And I'm sure you're sick of it too. And, you know, I'm sharing all this because even though I teach this stuff, it's easy stuff to listen to or talk about. You got to put it into practice and so do I. You got to catch yourself when the negativity starts. You got to cut off the voice in your head that is not your own. You got to knock this middle school shit off and start claiming your adult life because you do deserve to be happy. And even if you don't love yourself, I'll tell you what, I love you. Even if you don't believe in yourself, that's okay. I believe in you. And I'm going to keep on saying it until you catch up with me. Because I do believe that you can take the steps to reprogram your mind. You can take the steps to shut up that negativity in your head. You can take the steps to filter the world in an entirely new way and see how it's working to help you. And it doesn't take a whole lot of time to create a better life. Now go find a heart. I love you. You know, you've been on this incredible mm -hmm. journey of healing. What has it taught you about greatness? You can't be great without having peace and without going on a healing journey, in my mind. You can accomplish a lot. You can achieve a lot. You can get a lot of awards and make a lot of money. But I feel like if you feel like you don't are still aren't enough, then you're not great, I don't think. Because really it's think the so. enough, the thing that you're chasing is outside of you. It is outside of you. And again, I was chasing them to feel better about myself, to feel like, okay, I matter and I have value because I didn't believe I had value. And I think um, once you believe you have value, then you're creating from a space of love and win-win and service as opposed to I need to do this for me and look good and fill something up inside of me. You're doing it from a more healing journey uh, place and then you're able to give more you're able to create in a better place so a lot of my life was doing things to prove people wrong mm. that i felt abused abandoned made fun of by it's like well let me go make create succeed to prove people wrong mm. so when i would lose i was a bad loser because i was like oh i didn't prove them wrong i lost they were right and so it was just a different energy of creation. It's the second most powerful fuel is the fuel of anger and not enoughness. Right. You can go nonstop for years trying to prove your enoughness from that state. But it is exhausting energy. It's draining. It's like you feel like, oh, what was the point of this? So many times I accomplish things in sports, biggest dreams after 10 and 15 years of thinking about them, working hard and then accomplishing it and feeling like, so angry after I accomplished it because I thought I would feel something different mm. and I still didn't feel good enough. So I was like, I need to go create more and accomplish more. And then I would do it. And I was like, why am I still feeling alone inside? It's because I didn't have a good relationship with me internally. And once I started to shift that, I just feel such a good sense of peace. And because I have a meaningful mission that is not about me, it's about others as well. And you so talk about mission in this book. And I a think lot. that's the foundation is like getting clear on a meaningful mission that How is not about. How do you do that? Uh, I mean, it's I mean, a, you've got you've got the framework in here, yeah, but but I'm, I'm trying. I'm thinking, Lewis, about the person. It depends on the season of your life. And again, if you are trying to pay your bills, you can't think about a meaningful mission. You got to think about protecting yourself, safety, and getting to a place of well, that's financial a meaningful stability. mission, right? And that is a meaningful mission for this season, right? Okay. So when I was on my sister's couch, that's all I could think about was like, how can I make enough money? to get off the couch. Great. And so that was the mission for that season. But once you complete that, you gotta think about something bigger that includes others, right? And so I was still including others in that by adding value to people in order to get money from them, right? Essentially, I'm gonna give you a service, I'm gonna help you, and you're gonna pay me. Right. So I'm helping them overcome a problem. And I was using my, my passion and my power to solve a problem. And that's what I started to do. And then I started to, once I, once I overcame that mission or accomplished it, I was like, okay, now I can see a little bit further. Now what do I want to create? And the same thing happened with the School of Greatness. Once now, so they, hold on. I just yeah. went for, to tell everybody. So Lewis basically in looking for a job figured out how LinkedIn worked. Exactly. And then realized, oh, whoa, 
I can teach other people uh -huh. how to use LinkedIn like a pro. And so he literally became wildly successful being an expert on monetizing on and utilizing yeah. LinkedIn and one platform. And tell everybody how you came up with the School for Greatness idea. So after, I don't know, four or five years of, of kind of teaching LinkedIn and then expanding it into just social media and marketing in general and courses and stuff like that, I realized, okay, I had enough money for maybe two years to live. Oh, that's and pretty damn good, Lewis. When you're broke and poor, uh, at that least from my like point of view. the holy grail. Uh, when you're broke and poor, from my point of view, I didn't spend anything. I was like, I just need to stack everything because yep. I was in scarcity mode. Yep. So I wasn't like spending anything. So I had enough. And I also didn't have a car. You know, I was living in like an uh, apartment that was only $495 a month. I was like living in the, the lowest amount I could. I was like taking trains places, not like flying anywhere. I was like, how can I this save? This is Lewis the yes. squirrel. Yes, I was in his nuts, man. Trying to get Here nuts we go. Everywhere. That's put right. Him in, <laughs> put him in my back pocket. And um, and once I realized, oh, I can actually like, I'm surviving now, right? I'm, I'm thriving. I'm surviving. I got out of this kind of like scarcity mentality. Yeah. I was able to think beyond that. I was able to think beyond this like need to like just make money really quickly. And... Um, I realized I didn't want this anymore. This season of life, I was like, I don't want to do what I was doing in this business anymore. So I sold it to a business partner that I had. And I was like, okay, I've got about two years of cash if I don't make any money to survive. Yep. This is the exact moment when I got into the fight in the basketball court. I was going through a breakup in a relationship that I moved to LA for. And uh, I was just having breakdowns in life. And so I was literally stuck in traffic in LA a little over 10 years ago. Tuesday next week is my 10 year anniversary for my podcast. No way. Tuesday next week. So a little over 10 years ago, maybe 10 years and three months ago, I'm stuck in LA traffic. All this stuff had just happened. And I'm just thinking to myself, man, I've, I don't have it all figured out. I thought I did. I thought my ego knew it was right. Yeah. I thought I, you know, accomplished stuff and this and that and featured in the White House and all these other things. I was like, man, I should be the man, but I feel like a loser. And I was stuck in LA traffic. We were literally on the 405 and um, we were not moving. And all these people around me in cars stopped, were screaming and honking and flipping each other off. <laughs> and I'm honking and I'm like, man, I'm stuck. We're stuck. Everyone's stuck. And I was just like, okay, huh. If people are stuck in traffic and they're taking them so long to get places, what if I could offer value and solve a problem for them to get unstuck? This was literally what I was going through. And I was like, I need the solution myself. And I just started hearing about, hearing about podcasting. This was um, 2012. Like, I just started to hear like just whispers, you know, whisper, oh, podcasting, podcasting, what is this thing, right? And I was like, I literally called two friends in the car. It was a long drive, being stuck. I called two friends. I go, I know you have a podcast. I just saw you launch Who this were thing. They? Pat Flynn and my friend Derek Halpern. Okay. Called them both. And uh, I go, tell me about the podcasting thing. And they're like, I love it. It's the coolest thing ever. The audience I'm connecting, the building, the relationship, it's the best thing ever. I don't make any money, but it's the best thing ever. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. And I was like, man, I think I could do this because I had started to just interview people for myself, mm. recording it for me, like business leaders and sports athletes and all these people for years leading up to that. That's how I got in kind of the LinkedIn space. I would network with people, I'd interview them. And I just was like, man, I've learned so much from these people which got me here in my business results. So let me take it a step farther. And they were both telling me like, well, you should just make it about like marketing and entrepreneurship because that's what you're doing. Right. I was like, ah, it just doesn't resonate with me. I feel like I'm supposed to do something more. They're like, well, don't go too broad because it probably won't work. Oh, you mean like greatness? Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> and who are you? You're still just like getting started. You're like an internet marketer. You don't have a big audience. Like you can't go too broad. You just beat somebody up on a basketball court. I know, right. I mean, like you're, you're breaking down everywhere in your life. Yeah. And I was just like, <laughs> again, that voice kept saying like, I just feel like this is what I want to step into though. Mm. And even if it fails, I'm going to make it an experiment. I'm going to do it for one year, one episode a week for a year and just see if I like it. So I discovered the mission by exploring something, by being curious and trying it. 
And I gave myself some parameters. I'm not going to try to make money. Again, at that time, I had money for two years. Got it. Some people may not have that luxury when they're figuring this out in terms of making money. You might have to make money really quickly. If I needed to make money, I could have. Well, you also don't have to go all in. Exactly. What I loved about what you said, did did you hear what Lewis said? Experiment. He gave himself permission to experiment with something for a year. Number two, he took the pressure off and said, I'm not going to make this experiment generate money. Mm -hmm. And so if you can, whether you're on the couch or you're working a job, if you can give yourself the grace of an experiment Mm -hmm. and take the pressure off of money, you now are walking in the footsteps of greatness here. Mm -hmm. And so you set out on this experiment. And you didn't yeah. know shit about how to do it. I you have no two clue. friends that... I had an iPhone that I used to record in the beginning. I had no clue what I was doing. I was, you know, I was trying to do what I thought I was supposed to do. I was just like trying stuff. And my, it's funny because my assistant listened to the first episode like last week. She goes, I went back and listened to the first episode. She goes, you're a completely different person. And I'm like, because it was more about success, right? Mm-hmm. It was more about like achievement and winning and like results. Oh, I have to go back and listen. Now. It's like, you, Lewis, we're going to have to pop in a little right. audio of Lewis the, introducing Exactly. <laughs> then after, then I went to this workshop a few months later. Oh, the I one sp- where you spoke up for about, the first time? Yeah, about sexual abuse and all these things. And I actually, this is so funny, I actually learned the concept about no one wins. Or you don't win unless everyone wins around you. You know, that was like, what? That concept didn't make sense to me as an athlete. I was like, no, there was one winner. Everyone else must lose. Otherwise, you're the loser, right? That was kind of like the mentality that was I was trained with. Right. It was the programming that I was conditioned to have. And this workshop taught me that you don't win unless everyone wins. You embody that, dude. And it, and it is about, and it, thank you. And it's about, it doesn't mean, you know, Winning could look differently for everyone around you, but there must be like a win-win experience. Otherwise, your win doesn't mean as much if if others aren't improving and growing and succeeding in whatever it is they're doing as well, right? It doesn't mean it has to be equal winning or something like that. And that's why I was like, yeah, that's right. This this podcast can't be about like results. It should be about elevating others and about improvement and how we can all win together. Hmm. And that's when it started to shift and I started to like, be a little softer and be less like, let's just get results, you know? And, um, and it was beautiful. So there's there so much that happened in that first year of the experiment where I started to like try something and it, and it wasn't perfect the first hundred times. I, I just said, how can I make it better every time? How can I listen to the feedback and make it better every time? And, um, and how can I find my voice in this process? You know, even if I'm not comfortable sharing my voice, how do I find it by practicing it? Mm. And after the first year, I remember um, being like, man, I just really loved this and enjoyed it. And so 10 years later, here we are. I still love it. still enjoy it. Wow. When you think back on literally probably thousands of people that you've interviewed, Mm -hmm. what's one interview that you reflect on the most? I was going to say Kobe because he was my favorite interview. But when you said this, um, there was an interview the first year that I had with a guy named Chris Lee, who is the actual coach and trainer of the workshop I went to when I opened up for the first time. Really? He had such a massive impact on me from that experience that I ended up hiring him as a coach for a couple of years just to like coach me personally. Mm. And I had him come on the show and I had him put me through, well, I guess he put me through it, but I asked him about like, I was single at the time. I go, how do you find the dream like partner? And he put me through a guided meditation where he had me close my eyes. And he like walked me through a scenario and a scene of my future self. He said, I want you to imagine waking up next to this person. I want you to imagine what they look like, what they sound like. I want you to imagine what you, when you open the windows where you are in the world, what your view is. I want you to imagine the feeling, the experience you're having with this person. And um, the reason I'm talking about that is because I said to myself during that, my eyes were closed, I was like, (laughs) I don't know if this was weird or not, but I was like, I wake up next to the woman of my dreams, and when I open my eyes, she looks at me, and she's smiling at me every morning. And I remember just saying that. I don't know why that came to me, but I was like, she she looks at me, she's smiling at me, because she's so grateful 
and happy that we're in this relationship together. And essentially eight years later, I'm in a relationship with a person that wakes up, that literally opens her eyes and looks at me and smiles. And this is no joke. It happens every day. She looks at me, she hugs me. Some days she wakes up crying, I'm not kidding, because she's just a grateful human being. Not just because of like, I'm in her life, but she's just a happy person. And I dreamt of this. And so for me, that was a powerful, powerful episode because I had two other relationships before her and after this conversation. Those, those things didn't happen. And I realized that it only happened the moment I started to fully heal a lot of the emotional things that I still wasn't ready to face in intimacy. Mm. So I healed one element, but not all the other elements. And it wasn't until I, I literally there was a pain in my chest for still for years from other things, not the sexual abuse pain, because I could talk about that freely and be right. at peace. But in other things that I still wasn't willing to face, and it wasn't until I faced those things two years ago, there was a pain in my chest for many years that would come and go. It disintegrated after about five months of intensive therapy, integration, healing. It finally disintegrated in my chest, and I felt this ball of pain go throughout my body into like complete freedom. And it hasn't come back since. Wow. It took five months of intense reflection, exercises, practicing of healing the nervous system mm -hmm. to where that went away. Mm -hmm. That is literally a month or two later, I met her. Wow. And it's been a game changer ever since. Have you talked publicly about what that thing was that you faced? I just started, I haven't really talked about it publicly. I just started kind of telling people that, because I don't know if other people feel a pain in their chest. I don't know if, if you've ever felt like a ball that's kind of like this, not palpitations, but just kind of a nagging pain. I think people feel the, I feel it more kind of like right above the stomach. Yeah. That's sort of where my... And I know when it's coming because it hits the ankles first and then this clinches. Yep. Like wobbly legs or something? No, no like I feel literally the t when I get triggered, I literally feel it start. And it comes to your stomach. Yeah, but I think you want to know why. It's because that's how the person approached me. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah, I because it was used to be the throat and the chest for me. Mm -hmm. You just feel like I couldn't speak. Yeah. And there was like a pain here. And I was just like... It wasn't like I felt like I was having a heart attack or anything like that, but it's just like a nagging pain. Yeah. And it would come and go, and I couldn't figure out how to get rid of it or how to like eliminate it. And it just, I went to five months of intensive every week therapy, sometimes five, six hours on Saturdays, where I was just like, I'm a maniac on a mission to create peace, clarity, and freedom. The first day I stepped into therapy with the, my coach, I call her an emotional coach because I think we should all have one. She said, what's your intention for starting this process? I said, I want peace, clarity, and freedom. Because hmm. I didn't feel like I had e any of those. Can I take a guess at what your biggest block was? Sure. It was an inability to even allow love in. Is that what it was? I don't know if that's what it was. Maybe, but it was my inability to not abandon myself. What does that mean for somebody who's never heard that term? So it was my inability to, to not abandon myself in intimacy with one person, the person that I was choosing to be in a committed relationship with. Because I wouldn't abandon myself in other areas. Mm -hmm. I would stand up for, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Oh, for you like a nice guy doormat type in relationships? I was more trying to buy peace. So whenever my relationship, what, uh, the relationships in the past would try to, it would be upset at me. Yeah. You didn't do this. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll go do it now. Yeah. Whenever there was disturbance emotionally. Yes. You or the through? environment, or they were screaming at me, or they were cold shoulder, or they wouldn't speak to me. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't like this feeling. And so I didn't know how to navigate my inner world when that would happen. I didn't know how to be peaceful under chaos emotionally. So I would do things to buy peace. I would say, okay, I'll stop doing this. Even though I don't want to stop doing something, yeah. I'll stop doing it to make you feel comfortable. Yeah. Okay, I'll give in here. Okay, I'll, I'll come home five hours early. Okay, I won't go on that trip because you don't feel comfortable with me going alone. See, I don't think people understand how much men struggle with this. That, that no, I, I mean it. Like, you're, you, this is why I said you remind me a tremendous amount in mm. ways of Chris. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Like, just would shut down 
Yeah. And or give in or, or whatever, give in yeah. and not capable of expressing what he needed because his experience as a kid was it didn't matter anyway. Exactly. And a lot a lot of times, you know, in general, a lot of men were never trained on how to navigate uncomfortable emotions through their highest selves. They would navigate it through their ego self, which is to defend, protect, and show that everything's okay. And that works in some cases, but not in every case. And I think I didn't have the tools, the training, the knowledge, the experience, the wisdom on how to navigate stressful emotions in love, in an intimate, loving relationship. Mm. I could do it in business and sports and what other things. What was it modeled for you? It wasn't modeled when you're for little. me. Yeah, it was constant. It was a constant low level stress and like resentment from my parents of each other, which yeah. made me always like, ah, what's going to happen, right? And they loved me and I, and I knew they loved me, but it was, I knew they also didn't love each other. Yeah. And so that was stressful. Um, and so I didn't know how to how to be with a woman who was like, you can't do this, screaming at me, don't do this. I don't like when you do this. This is not okay, blah, 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 blah. Because what they are saying is you're not enough. And I don't accept you for who you are, Lewis. Mm. So I didn't accept myself for who I was. I, I, knew, I knew I wasn't enough, that's how I thought. So I said, I'm gonna do what's gonna make her feel like I'm enough for her. Right. And after a year, two years, three years of doing that and just giving in and giving in and giving in, you fully lose yourself. Yes. You lose all your, you, you lose who you are. And then you get resentful, you get frustrated, you get angry. So I lacked the emotional ability to say no. And if you don't love me and accept me and you want to walk away, that's okay. And I lacked the emotional ability to, um, to just be okay with me walking away from something as well. And that's why when I met Martha, uh, which you've met her oh, a couple she, times now. She smiles at you all the time. I had a, I had a, a fully different experience. Because, because you were different. Because I was completely different. And, and I just told her like straight up, I was like, this is my values, this is who I am, and I'm never going to abandon myself for anyone. Mm -hmm. you, this, that, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm just never going to abandon myself. Now, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be a flexible human being and supportive in all these other ways, but I'm not going to give up who I am to please one human being because they're not happy with me. Dude, if you could sum up the greatness mindset, I think you just did. There is this quote that goes viral all the time. I have no idea who said it first, but it's that thing that when you uh, put all your energy into trying to keep the peace with others, you create a war oh, inside yourself. That's and good. that is just what you described. Yeah. That tension in your chest, and so many of you listening listen with it, or that pit in your stomach is the war mm -hmm. that Lewis just described with yourself because you're so much more focused and concerned with keeping the peace, making sure everybody else is okay. And until you invert that mm -hmm. and you focus on creating peace within yourself, that's it right there. And this is the moment when it unlocked. I remember now exactly what happens when this the pain went away because I was working on, because I didn't feel free, right? And so for five months of therapy going in every week, I was committed. I was like, I'm going to figure this out and I'll go as long as it takes. Um, You're like a truffle pig for healing. I was like, He's going to root yeah, that yeah. thing out exactly. right there. I'm doing it, man. I'm and not going to stop until I'm healed. I, I love that. I'm I remember, proud of you. And, I'm, and healing's a journey. It's not an event that happens overnight. Right. There's an unlocking. There's an awareness moments. But then you've got to... Then PTSD occurs if you don't keep integrating it. Yeah. So it's a constant So journey. what was that moment? So the moment was many... Because every time I would meet my coach, she'd say, what's your intention? Peace, clarity, freedom. Okay. I didn't feel them. And so we were talking about what each one is. When do you do not feel peace? When do you do not feel clear? Freedom. And I was like, I've never felt free in my life. And a lot of it came down to modeling parents. They weren't free in their relationship. Mm. They both were resentful of being in the relationship. They both got married when they're 19. They didn't know any better. Yeah. They had four kids. They were working their butts off, just staying together. So I don't blame them, but they stayed together, not because they wanted to, because they didn't know how to how to navigate it as well. And so I saw them trapped. That was what it was for me. I saw them trapped and I was afraid to be trapped because I didn't want to repeat the feeling of them being trapped and feeling miserable a lot mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't want to create that in my life, but I didn't know how to stand up for myself. So that was the thing. And she just kept looking at me. It was kind of like a goodwill hunting moment. She was like, you're not trapped. You're not trapped. You're not trapped. 
you're a free man. You're a free man. You're a free man. And I don't know what it, it was just like all the months of like the practicing, the integrating, the, the opening it back up where it's just kind of like this like rush. It like finally connected to me that I am a free man, that I am not trapped. She was like, you can walk away at any moment. You can walk away at any moment. You don't have to keep working in this relationship. Like, especially since you're not married, you don't have to walk, you can walk away at any moment. But even if you are married, you're free. You can walk away. And that was the thing. I was like, I'm so afraid to get married because I don't want to have the shame of getting divorced mm. or the pain that caught that that happens after divorce that so many people go through. Well, it's so interesting. You were so focused on not feeling trapped that you actually trapped yourself. 100%. And it's so funny because I went to a prison almost every week for four, four and a half years, and I watched men who were trapped behind bars. But some of them were emotionally free. Mm. Some of them were there, but I saw them free men. Like they were in a state of complete peace. Not all of them, but some of them had so much love in their hearts, were very kind and generous. They had their families around and they were free emotionally, but they just did something that put them in there physically. Hmm. And I realized for so long that I was trapped emotionally, but free physically, and hmm. I didn't know how to break free. And that was the thing where I was like, I'm just sick and tired of feeling this pain. I'm sick and tired of repeating the pattern where yeah. I'm the common denominator in all these relationships, choosing them, staying in them, and not standing up for myself. So that was a massive game changer for me was investing in emotional coaching, showing up consistently when I didn't want to and doing the work. And I think a lot of us will get business coaches, career coaches, health coaches, but the emotional game is the game that most of us don't know how to master. And yet we, we won't invest in coaching or find support. And I just think it's so crucial. Well, you write at the very end of your fantastic book, The Greatness Mindset. You're talking about unlock the power of your mind and live your best life today. You have a huge section in this on healing. A whole section is healing. I feel like you cannot no, be huge great. huge section. I feel like, like you can't be great unless you heal. The of the book yeah. is healing. Like, I feel like it's not even unlock the power of your mind. It's literally unlock the power of your mind, body, and spirit. Well, integrate every, it all. Well, you know everything's a Trojan horse. So well, uh, that's gotta, true. You gotta bring people Nobody's going to pick are... up the healing book, so they're yes, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exactly. buy the mindset book. But guys, if people understood the art of falling in love with yourself, the world would be a much better place. Mm -hmm. Lewis, the world is a much better place because you're mm -hmm. in it. Thank you, Mel. And I um, wanted to ask you, let's see if I can Are you going to make me read one more thing? Or... I am not going to make you read one more thing, especially now that I know uh, I am that, happy that was to a read. trigger for you. No, I'm happy to. Give it to me. You I did get fantastic. Practice. Dr. Hyman, you just said something that really struck me, <clears throat> which is that every single one of us, our bodies, has an intelligent healing system. Yeah built into it. And I immediately thought about the fact that, you know, we all know instinctively that if you cut your hand, your body knows how to heal itself. Exactly. And so it's- You don't have to go to the doctor to get a prescription to heal your hand. It just does, knows what to do. Right? Yeah. And so can you just expand upon that for somebody who has never considered that concept, yeah. that your body is designed when you know how to take care of it, to heal itself, what the hell does that even mean? It's it's really incredible. I mean, I, I literally get to be the witness to miracles every day. And people who are either wanting to just optimize their health and live a long, healthy life, or people who have end-stage diseases like type 2 diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune disease, dementia, whatever it is, ADD, depression, when you know how the body works, you can learn how to optimize its function, which is what we call it functional medicine. And then you get rid of the stuff that's impairing our ability to function properly. And you put in the stuff that, that the body needs to thrive. So you take out the impediments to health, you put in the ingredients to health, the body knows what to do. And that's what happened. You know, why did, is there no more asthma in, in that story we just heard? Why, why is there no more pain? Why is uh, her life totally transformed? She said, I didn't know food had anything to do with that. I was feeling. Well, most people don't connect the dots between what they're doing in their life, whether it's what they're eating or the toxins they're exposed to or the stress they're under or the lack of sleep they're getting or the, lack, the fact that they you know, may not move their bodies or learn how right. to do all these things. They don't know how that's impacting them. They don't know how close they are to feeling good. We're literally only a few days, not weeks or months from feeling better. Okay, hold on. 
We're only a few days mm. away from feeling better. Yes. It's really remarkable. I take people all over the world. And I put them in, in these groups. We do these programs around the world and, uh, you know, longevity programs, detox programs. And we change their diet. We, we, you know, move them a little bit, a little bit of yoga. Not like running a marathon, but just general exercise, some simple body practices. And within six days, the average person reduces their symptoms from all diseases by 70%. What? Yeah, it's it's. I've done this so many times, and I'm like, I, I even shocked myself because like, whether you have migraines or irritable bowel or depression or insomnia or joint pain or fatigue or brain fog, whatever the stuff you're feeling, and I call it the FLC syndrome, which means what's you, FLC? Sit? When you feel like crap. Feel like <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a more there's a more serious version of that called FLS. Feel but, like shit. <laughs> yeah, yes. exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, well, I, and I, you know, what's interesting is that I think about. Uh, you know, we're constantly looking at what people DM us and mm -hmm. what they fill out in the forums at melrobbins.com. And I've started to wonder if part of the problem is that so many of us are, are used to feeling like shit. Yeah, we don't know how better we can feel. We don't have any insight because we've never, it's like you have an elephant standing on your foot your whole life. You don't know what it feels like when the element gets off until it gets off. And so then people have the insight. And, it is, you know, I've written many books about how to do this. I, yep. In my new book, Young Forever, I explain how to do this. Uh, I've written a book called The 10-Day Detox Diet, mm -hmm. which is really what I used in my patients to help reset autoimmune disease, reset the gut, turn off inflammation, and get rid of asthma, migraine, whatever it is when people are suffering from depression. Because we, we know now depression is inflammation in the brain. That, okay, I'm going to stop you right there. Mm -hmm. Because I want to go point... By point, by point, because I can feel, can you just hear Dr. Hyman winding up? I'm He's just about, winding up. He is so excited. This is a 63-year-old man with a six-pack for abs in the best shape of his life who has just written Young Forever, The Secrets to Living Your Longest, Healthiest Life. And this is a book not about uh, living to 170. This is a book about truly maximizing the years that you do have. Yeah. Being energetic, being strong, being vital, having like your presence of mind, being able to tap into the full opportunity of your life. And so I want to back up a couple steps because we were talking about the fact that your work in functional medicine as a medical doctor, decades of work with patients, of research, the books that you've written, we are going to link to all of this, everybody. So I know people are like, whoa, 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 what was that 10-day detox? It will be in the show notes. Don't you worry. We got you covered. But I want to back up a minute because you talked about the fact that our bodies are designed to heal. Yeah. And so I want to give people a metaphor to start to think about because you've already started talking about food mm -hmm. and that we don't stop and think about the fact that the environment that we live in and the things that we stick in our mouth and put into our body, and the stress that we endure mm -hmm. are all things that we can change for the better yeah. that have a material demonstrated impact on the quality of your health to the point where if you take this seriously within six days, you will feel better. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, what's so amazing, Mel, is that every cell in your body, your DNA, your microbiome, which are the bugs that live in your gut, your immune system, everything is listening to your thoughts. Everything is responding to your environment in real time. We call it the exposome. Your, your life is not predetermined by some genetic destiny. It's the life and the exposome, which is all the sum total of all the experiences you've had, all the toxins, all the thoughts, all the relationships, all the food you eat, yep. everything, washing over your biology, creating the expression of who you are in this moment. And so... That's a very empowering idea because it doesn't mm. just something just didn't happen to you. You can actually be empowered to understand what those things are and change them and radically reverse your your biological age, your your health problems, your mental health, because the body has this incredible healing system, as we said. Wow. Okay. So would a good metaphor, and maybe you have a better one, but I keep thinking about like if you think about the fact that a car, brand new car is designed to drive. Yeah. Right. It needs fuel, though. Yeah. So if you want to take care of your car, you put in the, the fuel that doesn't have a bunch of crap in it and or you plug your car in. Right. And you drive one of these electric cars. I think a lot about food as the fuel 
And if your car drives best on electricity or gas, you would never put sand yeah. in your gas tank because it would clog it up. Yeah. And so is that kind of a it's, metaphor it, to yes, get you it, thinking about how, exciting. what is it? What it's is more it? exciting than okay. that because yes, food is fuel, it's yeah. energy, right? Yeah. It, it, you need it to, you know, run your body. Yep. But there's this, all this other stuff in food that we've ignored besides calories and it's the informational molecules in, in food because food is not just calories it's information it's instructions it's code that upregulates your biology or downregulates it every single bite wow it changes your gene expression your hormones your brain chemistry your immune system your microbiome literally everything you're, is changed in real time by what you're eating and and it's the informational molecules, the medicinal molecules in food that are speaking to us and changing everything about how we feel. Like most people don't connect their food and their mood. No. Or their food and their asthma, or their food and their irritable bowel, or their food and their migraines, or their or food, food and their and depression. Or food anxiety. Or anxiety, depression. depression. I mean, I, I had a great story of, of, a, of a patient who was having horrible panic attacks. Yes. And uh, this was a guy who, you know, was kind of chubby, had a big belly. So I knew right away he was insulin resistant pre-diabetic and probably big swings of blood sugar and insulin okay stop said, <laughs> so are you talking about that like pregnant belly that dudes yeah, yeah, get yeah. okay so when i see a dude with a big solid basketball yeah. i'm like yeah. beer gut but what do you see well it's beer because it's sugar or it yep. could be sugar or bread or pasta or potatoes or rice or anything that's starchy and sugary will cause that belly fat so is that kind of like you know how when you put yeast in bread and it ferments and it starts not to quite, rise not, not no? Quite, okay. no it's actually fat oh that's actually fat <laughs> it's not okay. just gas <laughs> okay okay and and so this guy was telling me how he would have these horrible panic attacks he felt like he was dying he was part was palpitating he was sweating he, he couldn't breathe he, yeah. he felt anxious and the world was gonna i said wow what happens after that he said well i drink a can of coke and it goes away and i'm like Oh, you have hypoglycemia, right? You your blood sugar was crashing, and when that does, so you get into a life threatening emergency. Your body doesn't know that you you know you're you can go to the grocery store and get something. You think you got to go get food immediately. So it's really anxiety and and panic attacks can be caused by many things, but one of them is huge fluctuations in blood sugar, and we see this all the time. Wow, there are simple tools that you can use that act like lifelines in your life. And those tools are meaningful mantras, temporary or uh, permanent tattoos, or there are ways that you can use even a simple post-it note as a environmental cue. That's what a researcher calls it. You can use a simple post-it note to act like a lifeline, to remind you that you have the power inside of you to face something. And in those moments where it really counts and you're trying to level up that, yes, you can show up in this moment and you can perform your best. And so while we're going to start with the tattoo story, which is a great story, um, we're going to get to a deeper topic here. And by the time you're done listening to this episode, you're going to have a phrase that you've identified that will act like a lifeline for you moving forward. And because I always say this is not just a listening podcast it's a doing one, I'm going to ask you to do something specific and no, it's not to go get a tattoo. So on the topic of tattoos, <laughs> <laughs> if you have a tattoo or you know someone who does, you know that every tattoo has a story. And mine uh, begins just a few weeks before our 15th wedding anniversary. Can you believe this? We've been married 26 years. So this would have been 11 years ago right? 11 years ago. Yeah, 11 years ago. 11 years ago was 2012. And Chris, let's just set the table for everybody. Because 11 years ago, our life looked really different. 2012, you were still in the restaurant business. Mm. We were 800 grand in debt. <laughs> we were struggling with drinking issues. And we were trying to make the ends meet. And we thought a tattoo was going to save us. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we thought it would distract us. We we decided that... On no, our, it was our anniversary. It was our yeah. anniversary. And so we decided that it would be cool if we got tattoos on the date of our 15th wedding anniversary. And... Provided it wasn't the same tattoo. Well, see, this is the thing. I wanted to get matching tattoos. <laughs> I thought it would be super cool if you and I got the exact same tattoo 
on our 15th wedding anniversary. And what was your response? Never. Yeah, I think it was no fucking way. I, you, I think you said that is so cheesy. We are bound for divorce if we get matching tattoos. We are not doing that. And so that was kind of my idea. And Chris just shot it out of the sky. Boom, not happening. And so we got- Do you remember what my reaction was to even getting? A t- we had been talking about it maybe a little bit. I don't remember. Do you remember yours? Was it an out of the blue idea that, hey, let's do this for our anniversary or we had talked about it before? I think we had talked about how we both (laughs) wanted to get one and then we decided we'd get it for our 15th and I thought we'd get matching. You said absolutely not. And then all of a sudden we went into our corners and we were individually thinking about our tattoos. And as the date of our anniversary, August 24th, came closer and closer, and to the appointment, uh, I started to panic because I had no idea what I wanted for my tattoo. And then all of a sudden, you guys, Chris walks into the room one day and says, I've figured out what my tattoo is going to be. Why don't you tell him the story? Because I wanted to kill you when you told me what it was going to be. I grew up as a ski racer and was competing in races every weekend in my teenage years And I was always that kid in the starting gate that was shaken like a leaf and worried about not the race, but the outcome. You know, I was I was in my head thinking about what was going to be my time and how it was going to line up. And um, And would it freak you out? Yeah, I was always it, it was always about the result. Yep. You know, the the end game, if you will, for yep. me, or at least this was the observation that ultimately my dad had of me. And my dad was often at these races and he he helped me see the racing and the course a little bit differently by constantly suggesting that I just take it one gate at a time hmm. to just rather than think about the big picture or the end game, just one gate, one gate at a time. And along the years, my dad and I would converse about this without ever necessarily giving it a name of a philosophy, if you will. But he wrote a letter to me about it one day. And that was my, that was my wake up, my tattoo wake up call that I, (laughs) decided to pull the handwriting off of a letter my dad authored about just taking things one gate at a time. And so that became <laughs> that became <laughs> my tattoo idea. And and so describe where it is and what it is. I put this tattoo on my forearm, on my left forearm. And I didn't necessarily have a vision for having it kind of be oriented such that I could read it really easily. But mm-hmm. ultimately, it was the tattoo artist who suggested kind of the the right placement of it. But it's, yeah, it just says w- the word one and the word gate, one gate, written in my dad's ha- handwriting. It's beautiful. And so being the shallow piece of shit that I am at times, when Chris uh, (laughs) announced that he had figured out his tattoo and that he was going to take his dead father's handwritten letter to a tattoo artist and have that tattoo artist lift those two words, one gate, in his father's handwriting and put it on his left forearm where he could see it and have as a reminder, I thought that is the best damn idea and now I have no idea what the hell I am going to tattoo on my body. That is so, I was so pissed and so jealous that you had such a good idea. And you guys, I freaked out and stressed out until the night before we were supposed to get tattoos. The night before we were going to go into this appointment, our 15th wedding anniversary, I still had no idea what I was going to put on my body. And then luckily, a friend of ours, who was one of my very first clients when I became a life coach, Deva, who owns the amazing store in Boston called Matsu, she stopped by to say hi. And we started talking about the tattoo. 
And I said, I have no idea what I want. She agreed. Chris's idea, that was a really good idea. Really good idea. And I... Um, I didn't know Deva was the origin yeah, of this idea for you. Yeah. So what happened is I, I started saying, I, I don't know what to do with it. And she said, well, I know what it should be. And I'm like, you do? What should it be? And she said, it should say it shall be. I said, what? What, what, what do you mean it should say it shall be? She said, you say it all the time. I said, no, I don't. She said, yes, you do. I said, no, I don't. She said, Mel, you have coached me for years. You always say, if you put in the work and you hold the belief that'll happen, at some point, it shall be. I had honestly never realized that I had used that phrase when coaching other people. And as she said it in that way, it just kind of went clunk. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the words, it shall be, on the inside of my right wrist. And it will be both a reminder to me that if I do the work, if I have faith, if I keep my head down, and if I give up my timeline, it shall be. It'll all work out. It'll be fine. And um, so that was that. Now, meanwhile, there's another twist to this story. Because do you remember what happened on our actual 15th wedding anniversary? <laughs> do I ever? That's the funniest part of the whole story. Okay, well, tell everybody. Well, just that Mel had, Mel, you were in radio at the time. Yeah, right? it was when I was a radio host. So you guys, Chris was still in the restaurant business. So we she were had, struggling financially. She, had, she was doing some show in Boston and she had, it wasn't the tattoo artist you had you had had some show talking about tattoos Correct. right Correct. throwback and um all these people called in and they suggested like the best tattoo parlor in town Correct. You, if you're going to get a tattoo you have to go to this guy yes. and you of course took it upon yourself to book us the appointment which was at that point, it had to have been six months out. Yes, and they had a huge wait list. So you couldn't even get in until yeah. like four months out. We booked this thing six months out, you guys. So you Put down this for, big ass deposit. For our anniversary. We have a babysitter. We're going into Boston. We got our appointment. <laughs> we're about to pull on the Mass Pike. And what happens? We're no, we're pulling out of the driveway, and you you're like, well, where are we where are we go? Let's get the address of this place. And then you said, well, let me just call him just to make sure, let them know we're coming. And you call him, and sure enough, the guy says, I don't know, we got you on the books for next week. <laughs> <laughs> and I start pleading with him. Oh no, no, you can't! I we made this six month month. No, 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 no. It's next week. It's a week from today. But that's not our anniversary. I never would have screwed this up. This must be a mistake. Can you just fit us in now? No. And we were going away. We could like we couldn't even make the following. Yeah, week but the, also anyway. the thing was is it was supposed to be on the anniversary. Right. So now here we are with a babysitter. We have our tattoos. You've got your letter. I've got my phrase. We have no appointment. I start calling tattoo parlors because we decide let's just head into Boston. And I'm like, how hard could this be? Do you know the first five or six tattoo parlors that I called were booked? Like no openings. I didn't know you couldn't just walk into a tattoo parlor. Who the hell is getting all these tattoos? So I finally call the sixth or seventh place. And it was a place that was right around the corner from this apartment that we used to live in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when we first moved to Boston before we had kids for you to go to graduate school. And the guy answers the phone and he says, sure, come on in. And then he says, what's the name? And I say, Mel Robbins. And he goes, you mean from WTKK Mel Robbins? I thought I recognized this voice. I love your show. My wife's a huge fan of yours. Come on in. It turned out to be a guy that listened to my old radio show. So we drive to this place. The guy is this amazing, big, bearded, teddy bear of a guy. He gives us this big old bear hug. Chris goes first because here's the next twist that happened. It had completely been lost on me that I hadn't even picked out a font or handwriting. And so I had the phrase, it shall be, but I had no idea what I wanted it to look like or how big it was going to be. So while Chris got his tattoo, 
I pulled up Microsoft Outlook and I started going through the font choices and ended up picking the only font that looked somewhat cool, which turned out to be something called like Zaftigs or Dabdigs or Zad. It was like a Z. Printed it out on his printer. And that became what I permanently put on my body. And I was having like doubts and second guesses and Chris's looked so good. But I was just like, why didn't I think that I should have like thought about the font? It looks a little bit like your handwriting though. So that's good. It's, a, it's yeah, <clears throat> it's okay. I mean, it's fine. I, it's, I, I love my tattoo. I love my tattoo. And so I've got these sort of curved, uh, it shall be right on my inside wrist and big hooky things. And we'll, we'll, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see it. Um, we'll put it on the stories. And the thing that I love about this, and this is why it's so important for us to talk about meaningful mantras today and environmental cues that you can use to help you stay steady, to help you tap into that courage and that confidence and that power that's inside of you. And over the years, I can't tell you how many times I've looked at this tattoo. And these words, it shall be, they are a lifeline for me. You know, when I think about moments where I was failing at something or life was going off the rails, I would see those words, it shall be. And I'd take a deep breath and I'd put my head down and I'd say, Mel, you just got to keep believing it's going to all work out. You got to keep putting in the work. If you're a good, kind person, it'll happen. Maybe not on your timeline, but just keep going. When times were tough, these three words, it shall be, reminded me that this is just a moment. And like all moments, this will pass. And now our puppy, homie, is like wanting to go to the bathroom. <laughs> it shall be. No, but it really, it, it, thinking about the question that Jonathan wrote in and saying how you're so intentional in everything mm. that you do it was it was a very thoughtful question and and i would agree that your your application of that in life is very pronounced and interesting how you didn't necessarily see it like deva saw it mm. and how <laughs> the only thing that was not intentional about it was the the scramble to get the right tattoo before the evening <laughs> itself. Well, you know what's great about this? Actually, I shouldn't say that because you booked the appointment. We had it on the anniversary. Like we were, we were, we were organized. Yeah. We were ready to roll. There you was know intentionality. What I like, the entire story of the tattoo is a demonstration of the philosophy it shall be. Because none of nothing went according to plan. And yet we just took it one gate at a time. <laughs> and I was fierce in my belief that it was all just going to work out. What are the odds that the appointment is on the wrong date or that the first five places I call are not available for appointments, but the one that is happens to be a guy that listened to my little local Saturday radio show and recognized my name and voice? Like, it's just a little bit of optimism that acts like a lifeline for me. And it reminds me that it's going to work out, that I have the power within me to face things. That's how I've been using this phrase, it shall be over the last 11 years, because these have not been the easiest 11 years of our life. I would argue some of the hardest. The hardest, for sure. I mean, when I think about the state that you were in when you left the restaurant business just two years after I got this tattoo and you just checked out of life, you're like, I'm getting sober, I have to heal, I have to take care of myself. And for two years, you were just comatose. And I'm like in survival mode. And I would look at this, my tattoo, it shall be, it shall be. And it gave me faith that if I just kept working hard, we'd figure it out that we'd figure out how to pay the bills, that I would figure out how to build this business, that you would figure out how to heal and find your way back to yourself and to me. And even things like moving up here to Southern Vermont and how hard that was and feeling like 
I've just turned my whole life upside down. And yet there was this deeper knowing that drove our decision to move and to change our life profoundly from living outside of Boston to being in this tiny rural town. And on those days that I just felt so lost, I would look at my wrist and go, it shall be. It's going to work out. Like, I can do this. And even with the podcast, everybody was like, you know how crowded that is. You know how oh, there's 5 million podcasts. I was like, you know what? I'm playing the long game. I'm not, I'm, I'm, it shall be. I'm going to put in the work. I'm going to go for it. And, and I even feel that like when our kids are struggling. Like it just, it, it, it helps me this phrase, it shall be, to put almost like a beacon out in the future. It's a reminder that at some point the road ahead is easier and great things happen and it gives me faith to keep going. I think the location of that tattoo is also properly aligned with you and your own just being reminded of that, right? Because if you had that tattoo on the back of your shoulder. I'd never you, see it. Where you weren't seeing it all day, every day. You had always wanted to put it right, something. Whatever it was, you were thinking. Well, why get a tattoo and hide it? Right. You know? So I just wanted to check in on you because there's a lot going on right now. I was sitting at my desk yesterday and I got the news that Stephen Twitch Boss had died from suicide. And if you have not seen this news or you don't know who he is, let me just kind of share a little bit about him and why it impacted me. Um, so he was best known, and this is how I knew him, for being one of the executive producers of Ellen DeGeneres' talk show. And he was not only an executive producer, he was on that show every single day, five days a week. He was the DJ. He would do all the dance parties with Ellen. He has this huge, amazing megawatt smile. And his energy, he's just one of those people that you didn't need to know him to know that <clears throat> literally positivity, dancing, spreading like kindness, that's what this guy was all about. And you didn't need to know him to, to know that he was also all about his wife, Allison, and his three like gorgeous kids. And during the pandemic, not only was he there with Ellen, but he and his wife, who are both dancers, started doing all of these choreographed awesome videos that went viral online. And they spread so much joy for people doing these dances and teaching people with their kids all these dance moves. And they just were this positive, amazing force. And so when I heard the news that he died from suicide yesterday at the age of 40, it just rocked me to my core. And I'm still processing it like 18 hours later. And when I woke up this morning, I also saw that I had missed the fact that yesterday was the 10th anniversary of Sandy Hook. And so I just felt this need to grab my coffee and to run up here. I haven't even washed my face yet this morning and talk to you. And I just wanted to share what I'm thinking and feeling because I think it's really important that in moments like this where the news feels overwhelming or the world feels overwhelming, and I know the holidays can just bring up a lot of stuff for a lot of us too, I want to check in on you. And I want to check in on myself. And so that's why I decided I'm just going to get on this mic and I'm going to just talk to you. And that's it. That's what we're doing today. So first things first, let's unpack or I want to share with you what I'm thinking in the wake of learning that somebody that was so light and positive and amazing on the outside, how do you process that kind of news? that they died from suicide. And notice the word I'm using, 
I'm saying died from suicide. And that's because I think about a death from mental health struggles the same way I think about a death from cancer. Like if you have a friend that dies of brain cancer, you say they died from cancer. If you have a friend or a loved one, as every single one of us does, who has died from a struggle with addiction or depression or trauma or toxic stress or any other mental health issue, that mental health challenge deteriorated the physical structure of that person's brain. That's what happened. The same way that brain cancer physically deteriorates the brain until it kills somebody. And so the word choice is really deliberate because it's a recognition of what actually happened. There's a couple other bigger things that I just have to say, and that is that you don't, you don't need to know somebody. Like you don't need to know Twitch personally to be affected personally by the news of his death. You don't have to have lived in the Sandy Hook community to be impacted by the news that it was the 10th anniversary yesterday. Because these things that are happening out in the world trigger you to remember experiences of loss in your own life. And so for me personally, I think one of the reasons why I have been so rocked by this news is because, you know, if you look at somebody like Twitch on the outside, this man exuded positivity. You never saw him without a smile on his face. You couldn't watch those dance videos without feeling the ripple of joy. And for me personally, it reminds me of a really dear friend of mine that died from suicide over 10 years ago. And the second that I heard this news about somebody who on the outside looked like they were just doing great, it reminded me of losing somebody that was the same way. And that may be happening to you. And the other thing that this is bringing up for me is that you just have no clue what's going on in somebody else's life. You focus on the beautiful smile that somebody has or the great job or the bank account or the awesome spouse or the wonderful kids or the big house, but people don't live at their house. You know where everybody lives? They live inside their heads. And you and I don't have a clue what it's like for somebody else to live with the pain inside their heads. And so, you know, one of the major takeaways here for me is one of Twitch's biggest messages, which is being kind. And the fact that being kind and being positive around other people, you have no clue. In fact, we underestimate the impact that it can have on somebody else's life to just be kind to them. And so that's one takeaway, that you just don't have a clue. So please just don't assume that you know what's going on and assume that everybody is silently battling something. So it's on all of us to be kind to one another. Second thing that I want to say is I need you to be kind to yourself today because there's a lot swirling around right now. And so if you notice that you're thinking about people that you lost, which I am, I mean, yesterday what was happening for me as I heard the news and I, of course, immediately thought about his family is I was transported back to the day that I learned that our dear friend Fred had died from suicide. And it's like I started reliving that day again as I thought about the pain that Twitch's wife, Allison, and his three kids were feeling, I thought about this particular moment on the day that Fred died, where I was with his daughter, and we were walking up the front steps to his house, and I knew that when we opened that door, I was going to be present when she learned that her father had died. It is a moment that changed me forever. And so that's also what was happening for me yesterday. And I was thinking about, you know, how much I miss Fred. And I was thinking about how sad and heartbroken I am about all the other people in my life that had struggled with mental health issues and 
addiction or hopelessness or depression and how they all died from suicide and just how much pain there is out there. It can be really overwhelming. (sighs) If that's happening for you, just be kind to yourself. Like you may need to sleep in. You may need to go for a walk today. You should probably reach out to a friend and talk to somebody about it. It would be good for you to remember the person and, and the things that you miss about them. Like remembering somebody that is gone and, and thinking about the things that you really loved about them, that's a really healthy thing to do on a day like today. But simply being aware that news like this brings up stuff for you that's personal, that's step one. Step two is being kind to yourself. Step three is being proactive about taking care of yourself today and reaching out. And step four is understanding this issue in a larger context. And so now I want to kind of switch gears and address something that's pissing me off. As I see people processing Twitch's death in particular, because this hit me as hard as Robin Williams, as hard as Anthony Bourdain, and I think the reason why it hits people so hard is because You're trying to make sense of somebody who seems like they've got it all together on the outside. And it, in your rational mind, it just makes no sense. And that is where the learning is. See, your mind is rational right now. You're objective. You're not living with the pain the person was living with. So when you look at the situation from your lens, you remove the pain that the person was feeling. And so it makes no sense to your brain because your brain wasn't compromised from the mental health struggle that that person was really battling day in and day out. And so let me go back to the example of brain cancer. If you have a friend that's dying from brain cancer, you see them deteriorate on the outside. You see what's happening. You would never in a million years when somebody dies from brain cancer go, oh, that's so selfish. Why did they choose to do that? What about their family? But they had so many resources. But I see so many people writing this horse shit online and it's pissing me off because it shows that you don't have a freaking clue what it means to struggle with a mental health issue. You don't have a freaking clue. And it really pisses me off when I see people that write really arrogant pretentious things like, well, I struggled, I was in a dark thing, and I asked for help. Well, that's great. I'm happy that you didn't get so bad, that your brain wasn't so deteriorated, that you could ask for help. When somebody gets to the point that their brain functioning is so eroded that they cannot cognitively, rationally process the fact that there is a huge difference between ending the pain that you're dealing with and ending your life. When somebody gets to the point where they can't think clearly, it means the physical structure of their brain has deteriorated from the mental health battle. That's what that means. And that smile that people put on their faces the whole way through That is so hard. Can you imagine to get to the point where you love your family so much that you think the only way to save them is to get rid of yourself? Like this is just, that's how compromised your brain is. And so when I think about this, like brain cancer, that the physical brain functioning is deteriorating to the point where nobody can think rationally. That removes all judgment, and all I have is compassion and sadness. That's it. That is it, and that is all there is to have for the people that you've lost, for the folks that we continue to lose, and for anybody that's listening to this. If this is you and you're in a really dark place right now, I want to speak directly to you right now because you're meant to hear this right now. You can address the pain that you're feeling in your mind and your body. You can. And there are people standing by right now that are trained that want to help you. And with support and with small 
tiny moves forward every single day, you can make this pain lessen, you can loosen the grip it has on you, and you can feel better. You can also improve the physical structure of your brain. You can improve the way that you think so that your brain starts to support you. You can face this with a little bit of support. You can. And you can do that, and I want you to do that because we want you here. You have a big, beautiful life, and I know that if you believe that you could somehow lessen the pain you're feeling, you would want to live that life. And so please, please, please get support for the pain that you're feeling and hold on to the life that you have because your life is worth fighting for. And there are people that want to help you. We have resources in the show notes not only for here in the United States, but also for multiple languages, international resources. And so I just felt the need to talk to you, to check in with you. Um, Be kind to yourself today. Stop assuming that you know what other people are thinking. Remember the people that you've lost and the things that you loved about them. And um, together, we'll get through this. We will. I promise. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe.